I just got through working in the morning, training clients, walking out of the gym. So my the gym I trained at, it's pretty much, it's like all glasses, just like all like that. So everybody's looking out that way. There's three fugitive squad. I'm getting in my car, three fugitive squad people put guns to my head. I created Species Nutrition with one mission in mind, to provide bodybuilders and serious athletes with no-nonsense supplements that work. I put my name and reputation on every bottle of Species Nutrition products. If you want to be your absolute best, join the evolution. Welcome back to another episode of Iron Therapy. I'm Dave Palumbo, joined as always by our RX Muscle Staff Psychotherapist, Leslie Timble, and our special guest today, Armand Adibi. Uh, I, I didn't think it would be possible for anyone to, anyone's story to outdo Mac Truck's story, who came on last week and really opened up to us, but uh, Armand, uh, <laughs> Armand might eclipse that this week. Armand, thank you for joining us. Yeah, absolutely. How are y'all doing? What's up, Les? Nice to see you guys. Hey, Leslie. Yeah. 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 yeah I, so I mean, I've had a lot of you know, me and Dave have been friends for twenty years, so he yeah. he knows a lot of my crazy life. But um, you know, some was good crazy, bad crazy. But the lot, you know, I guess in two thousand and uh, well, my mother got sick in two thousand. Let, let me let me stop you for a second because I want to say something first of mm -hmm. all, just to the, our audience. Um, it's very hard, especially for bodybuilders, because we, we seem to like wall off our emotions. You know, that's that's what we're all about, muscling up, right? Cover up all the all the pain and the hurt that we have emotionally uh, through our physical endeavors, so to speak. So it's very hard sometimes uh, for people to come on here and open up and, and fully lay out what's going on in their life because it, it, it makes you very vulnerable. And I know Jimmy the Bull did it. Um, Mac did it to the point where I think Leslie and I were both in tears listening to his story. I mean, it was it was very touching. And um, so I I give everyone who comes on the show credit to be able to you know open their world up and tell people what they've gone through. Uh, it is a therapeutic process, but it's also scary. And uh, Arma, I just wanted to just tell you we're, we're I'm I'm privileged to hear your story here today because I think people need to hear what happened to you. Yeah, I appreciate it. Yeah, you know, a lot of times, you know, you got your group of friends and like my group of friends, I'm always the guy people come to if they need advice, they need to talk to or they're having issues. And then when you're going through a crisis, it's like, you know, I got you and a few other friends, but most of my friends really like, man, I don't know how I'd go through this or man, I don't know how I'd already committed suicide by now. I'm like, well, thanks, <laughs> thanks. but um, so mine's a little long and there's, it, 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 you know, it goes over um a few different subjects too people especially men um in one part are, you know have a lot of issues with and they got to be really careful so i'll back up and i'll kind of start um because a lot of emo this is real emotional too so i'll kind of answer a lot of questions because people ask me a lot too why i retired from competing at a young age when i was kind of climbing up the ladder and uh it, it, this is this tells why too because i get asked that literally every single day so 2014 or, or 2013, my mom uh, passed away um, from stage four breast cancer. She was diagnosed um, for stage one. The doctors did some really crazy stuff. They did double mastectomy and long story, they didn't, it wasn't needed. And so I quit work that year. Um, I still kept my apartment out in Dallas, but I drove, I stayed in Arlington most of the week just so I can spend as much as time with her as possible, which, you know, they will, you can ask them how long do they have. They said maybe about three to six months and she lasted uh, like 13 months. So I got a lot of time with her. Um, so I do appreciate that because a lot of people, they just, you know, pass suddenly and you know, you don't get any closure. So I did appreciate that. Um, 
So during that time, you know, you know, you she Arma to- was she was she really sick though? I mean, like during that time, was it like a was it not quality time or was was she pretty good until the very end? You know, she was good till the very end. So okay. the breast uh, went through all throughout her body, so it was in all her bones. So you know, when the doctor they did the the scan, all her bones lit up. So it was in all her bones, and then the surgeon before doing surgery she just didn't even look at the scan and just perform surgery a mastectomy which doesn't even do anything when it's already through your whole body in stage four so uh we could have sued her and done all that but we didn't want to go through all that you know afterwards it's not going to bring her back so um that just literally happened and during that time she was sick uh yeah i would say probably about the first eight months she was good i mean she was not herself like she was always very energetic always doing uh she had a group of church women she would always hang out with it was a big group they would go to concerts dinners all that stuff my dad her and my dad would take trips all the time he was about to retire um she was about to retire she she taught special needs kids um and so she had a really big heart for kids um and so we had a lot of quality time together And then at the very end is when it got bad, when it spread to the, uh, when it spread to the brain, that's when it was, you know, I knew it was, and all she prayed for was like, I just hope I don't lose my mind with y'all. You know, when it starts affecting your brain, you can, you know, go crazy, you know, say stuff to your loved ones that, you know, is hurtful. And she just prayed that never happened. And it didn't, she had her mind all the way till the end. Um, but I was, you know, I pretty much quit work and I was taking care of her uh, at home. I would just stay home all day. I'd go, you know, train a couple people locally at Metroflex and just spend, and all the questions I ever wanted to know about my mom, my dad, like I just asked her everything. I mean, there was, I mean, I told her pretty much everything anyways, because we were, that was my best friend. Some people, people's relationships are different. So sometimes, you know, I've had friends where parents die and it's like not that hard. They're like, you know, it's not a big deal to them because they weren't very close or they were, you know, they didn't have a good relationship, but that was my best friend. So um, I think that's part of the reason why when I always dated girls, I never really wanted anything serious. It's because, you know, I always compared them to my mom and it was impossible to live up to that. Um, so at the end, it got really bad. I was seeing several girls at this at the time. Um, not going to lie, I had a couple sugar mamas or whatever you want to call them, but uh, paying bills because I quit training. I, I quit working all the way through the week. So I had several girls like helping me financially too because I quit work and I still had to keep my apartment. And, um, you know, I was just basically uh, treating my mom to whatever she wanted to do, you know, just just spoiling her in, you know, her last days. But she uh, she finally passed when I was... Uh, at the end, I was seeing about four different girls dating about four different girls at this time. And um, they were all trying to be there for me. And, you know, a lot of people see it as a way to kind of slip in your life. I'm in a vulnerable position, things I might not usually do or people I might not usually hang out with. Um, I did. And it, I made some judgments that weren't very good. I I was around a lot of women that were there was red flags everywhere. Um, and one of them, um, literally, uh, we broke up about, I would say a month or so, maybe a little more before my mom passed away because Dave was prepping me for nationals that year, 2014. Uh, she, yeah, she just passed away in 2014. I get it mixed up sometimes. So Dave would, Dave was like, I think it'd be good for you to do a show. But before that, I found out I was having a daughter or a child uh, literally the day after my mom passed away because, um, you know, I had one of the girls, she came to the funeral. Um, We weren't talking before them. Like we broke up. It was, uh, you know, she had a rocky pregnancy and um, I moved her in with me during that time because she was a pot smoker and i was so excited to have my child i wanted to make sure that i could like monitor her and essentially control make sure she's not doing any drugs while she's pregnant with my with my child right and um 
I'll just call her my ex because I'm not going to say any names. Uh, yeah. Her family was very holistic, didn't believe in any medicine at all. So the kind of argument was, you know, um, you know, because I, I did come home before from working and I caught her smoking marijuana like six months pregnant. And yeah. I mean, I was devastated. I was heartbroken. I mean, is one time probably going to do something? Probably not. But it's still the fact that you're trying, you're, you're pregnant. This is your child. And that like literally broke my heart. We got in a huge argument. Swear it never happened again. She was saying, well, the Zofran, that's poison to the baby. I'm like, no, <laughs> marijuana is proven to cause, you know troubles so happened once again and that's when um we kind of like broke up and i'm like i don't know i don't know what to do i can't if she's gonna smoke she's gonna do it find times during the day to do it or whatever yeah. so during that time um we were living in my apartment then i eventually it, when my daughter was born i got us a house um right outside of dallas and uh plano so uh this is a lot of information, so I might pause a lot to try and kind of think about it. Um, so in my right mind, I would have never settled down with this woman, anything like that. The whole time dating too, I was trying to remind her like, hey, I don't want any type of future with you. Um, and we, we had some breakups too, and she found a way to kind of slither back in my, I don't know what you call it, come back in my life. Um, and, uh, you know, it was funny because my mom met her once and my mom always met, you know, most girls I was dating to kind of get the approval. And she, you know, my mom was always, yeah, she's really nice or this or this, but this girl, she goes, I don't like her. I'm like, what? Cause my mom was always very sweet. She always saw the best of her. She's like, something's just off. I just, I just don't like her. I'm like, well, what is it? She's like, I just, I just don't like her. I don't know. And I'm like, okay. And then, um, we broke up and then when we got back together, my, she, my mom was like really upset. She's like, baby, why, why are you hanging out with her? Like, you, you don't need to hang out with her. You can do better. I was like, mom, she's just one of like four girls I'm hanging out with. I'm not trying to marry this girl or whatever. But, you know, moms know things, you know, as parents, you know, I being a parent now, we can sense things as, you know, like our children, you know, with our children. But the funeral happened and she came to the funeral um before that i didn't see her a month before that i mean uh and she was like you know full blown um so afterwards her face was a little full and her boobs were a little fuller and i'm like are you pregnant i and know she's like why do you ask that i'm like oh, are you pregnant <laughs> because you look pregnant because your face is full and your boobs are fuller um and she starts crying and say yes. And I'm like, when did you find out? Uh, she said three weeks uh, before your mom passed away. I was upset. I'm like, why didn't you let me know? I, I could have told my mom I was having a child. I mean, you know, not that it would matter, I guess. But she goes, I don't. I didn't think you were able to handle it. You know, it would just be too much on your plate, which it could have been. So. Um, I got a funny story. I, I am when my I had been married, you know, and, and briefly for a year or two, I was dating this girl for a long time back in the nineties. My ex Barbara and uh, she came over to my house like because I was giving her like I was we had separated. I was paying her monthly some money, and she came over to get a check for me. And I said to the same thing. I said, to, so "You pregnant?" And she's like, "Why do I look fat?" I said, "I don't know. I just <laughs> and she didn't even know. She didn't know." She and then she called me like like the next like a week later and she or, and she's like you're an asshole I'm like what do you mean she's like you knew I was pregnant before I did <laughs> <laughs> it was, it's pretty it wasn't mine it wasn't mine it was, oh. it was, you know, she was dating oh. another guy yeah it okay. wasn't yeah we weren't yeah we weren't hanging out or anything like that but it was just funny but go ahead finish sir <laughs> yeah so um, you know I I decided I was you know I'm gonna man up and I'm gonna take care of my child I was actually I was actually excited because my mom just passed away and I'm devastated. I don't know, you know, during that time, um, I had shoulder surgery too, like a year and a half prior. And my, I had two shoulder surgeries on my left shoulder. So I was, didn't even know if I could bodybuild again because my shoulder was never the same. So during that time, I wasn't really working out much either. And then that's why afterwards I decided to start working out again. And then we did three shows that year. Yeah. Um, so, 
I decided, you know, to get a house and my plan, I had it from the beginning. I'm like, okay, I'm not going to marry this girl. I'm not going to end up with this girl. Um, she lies a lot. She believes her own lies. Just a lot of, a lot of things about her. I just do not like, and I, I do not want in a partner, you know, it's just, you know, the person, this is not the person I'm going to spend my life with. Um, so moved her in play, I'm playhouse, you know, family for about two years or so. And then my plan was to cordially separate and co-parent. And, um, I don't know why I thought this would work being, you know, the knowing that her nature, <laughs> but, you know, I spoke to my father too. And he's like, uh, in his accent, Persian accent, no, no, you know, you want to be around your baby and, you know, don't, you know, and I was like, I know dad. I'm, he's like, he's like, be a man, just fake it, you know? And I said, okay. So, uh, got us a house. Uh, you know, I pretty much, um, took care of my daughter full time because this girl was in the restaurant business. So, you know, you're working full days coming home at midnight sometimes. So, um, I pretty much, did everything, woke my daughter up, play with her all day, bathed her, fed her all day. So, and then the times she would come home, I would go train people at the gym. And then most, most of the money was coming from coaching too, at that time with training, you know, also, uh, I had to adjust my schedule a little bit, but I loved it. I mean, I, it was, it was amazing. Um, there's nothing more enjoyable than going from my life. I live such a wild, crazy life, women, you know, bodybuilding full-time, partying, being extremely selfish to being selfless and taking care of this little, you know, child that's yours. And so I, I, I fell in love with it. And so we started kind of getting distant. Um, you know, she was jealous of the child. I'd be, you know, always loving on my daughter. And, you know, she's like, all you care about is my, your daughter. You don't even care about me. I'm like, well, yeah, but I didn't say that. I'm like, you know, so kind of started getting distant. Plus at the time I was still seeing these other girls and I would be open with her and tell her like, Hey, I see other girls because, you know, I really don't, uh, the things you tell me sometimes, you know, just doesn't really make sense. Like uh, you, you lie a lot. And I don't know if she didn't believe me or didn't, or just didn't want to, but, uh, she was like, whatever I'm on. And so I was like, I guess she was in denial, but I literally told her. <laughs> Should I got to stop you, Armand. Leslie, just off the, off the bat, without hearing the rest of the story, because I know you know the story, but not even knowing the rest of the story. To me, if I was just hearing him tell me the story, I'd be like, this is a time bomb waiting to happen. It's just, <laughs> you know, it's like he's, he's he's like he thinks he's being honest with this girl, but it's like it seems like it's like almost like the rage that must be going on inside of her must be insane at this point, don't you think? There's definitely some mental health issues with this woman, and I haven't even met her, but just by her actions and her attitude and her perspective on life, yes, yes. But, but I'm saying just in, in what he's telling her, too, I mean, you know women can't handle that. You know, oh, yeah, by the way, I'm, I'm hanging out with other girl, girls during the day when you're at work or whatever, or after work or whatever the case may be. It just, it, that doesn't usually bode well, you know. Not typically, no, no. Yeah. So... We planned, uh, she wanted to take a vacation. She was pretty much like kind of started having a nervous breakdown um, because I had some little health issues. I had some sinus surgeries I had to have and they were really, really intense. So I had to have a surgery and then I couldn't pick up my daughter for like three weeks. So she had to, we had to get care, um, you know, from her, her parents lived in, uh, she's from the country, like, uh, country country about a couple hours away from here so we had to get her mom to come over and take care uh while she was working and her mom literally asked me like can you pay me for babysitting i'm like is, is your mom kidding and she's like no you know they're you know hard up on money i'm like yeah sure i'll give her some money uh you know whatever um and you know uh they're really odd. They were just a really odd family. Um, just a weird bunch. I mean, they, she didn't really get along with her mom. She would tell me stories about ex-boyfriends that didn't really make sense of them being abusive. I would ask her mom about it. She's like, no, she's just being paranoid. That's none of that stuff's true. And then I would tell her, tell her that my ex and she was like, no, my mom, my, my mom would never say that. My mom knows everything that happened. So 
it was, I'm like, I'm just in a mess. And so I was just trying to like do my own thing, work, concentrate on my daughter and just be like, this girl is just nuts. Something, she's got some serious issues. We all have issues, but she's got some serious ones. And um, we, she wanted to go on a vacation. So we planned a vacation and I had to have the surgery. So we, could, we didn't get to go. So the doc, so we re, we replanned the vacation to, um, she set it all up. And then when I was healing from that sign of surgery, um, it was like four or five weeks post, uh, surgery, I was bathing my daughter and I started bleeding out. Like my nose turned on like a, like a water faucet. I had to actually get a blood transfusion cause I lost so much blood and they had to call the doctor to do emergency surgery that night. Um, and so, uh, we didn't get to go on that trip either. Once that happened, uh, she really needed to get away. And she goes, I just want to get away with you. I miss you so much. We just need time together. And I'm just like, whatever. I would just like a vacation too at that time. Um, once that happened, it was just kind of like downhill. I saw her kind of just going downhill, not eating. She was losing a lot of weight. Um, I was even questioning if she's using, you know, drugs at this time because her behavior was just, just really emotional. Um, so, you know, I would when she was home, I would always kind of leave. I'd either go work or go hang out with somebody else. And uh, there was so much going on in this, in this time. It's just, I had, um, I was doing a, a side gig job, you know, for money too, and like a male entertainment stuff. And um, so I was kind of doing that on the side too, to help support the family, because I was pretty much paying all the bills. And before that, like I said, I took all that time off from work. And, um, so, uh, it starts getting, you know, more rocky and rocky and, uh, we get an argument one night. Um, I don't even remember what it was about. I'm laying on the bed, like with my hands, like out like this, like, uh, supporting all my weight, always kind of stretched like that while I was talking to her. And I said something to her and she flipped out through, through my phone at my, my face, missed it. Then she ran by me and punched my arm like that, and it my elbow popped in, and I tore my tricep completely from the bone. Oh, um, at this time, I was on um, the antibiotic we were talking about the other day. Um, what? The devil an antibiotic. The cefepime or vancomycin? Um, not the vancomycin. The one for tendon tears that causes tendon tears. Oh, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. Leviquin. Leviquin, Leviquin, yeah. So my tendons were really weak, so it just popped. And I'm like, that was when I was trying to kind of make a, that was 2015. So I was kind of yeah, trying to make a comeback in bodybuilding. It was my off season. And I was like, like, I was devastated. And um, after that, uh, got in another argument another day. <laughs> um, you know, I was sitting down, I was waiting for my breakfast. She was boiling eggs. She got a boiling egg got right out of there and came up and threw it right in my head. It smashed my head and doesn't sound like a big deal, right? It literally burned me open wow. and all that got stuck in there. I had to do laser treatments for a year to get rid of the scar. It was so bad. And then after that, I was like, I got to, I got to. Hold on. Why'd she do throw the egg at you? I, we were arguing and I was like, we're not meant for each other. And, you know, I said some mean things too, like you're a, you know, what, whatever and whatever. And she just flipped. And I think she kind of knew that it was getting to that point where, um, she knew my personality where I'm just like, I'm, I'm done because that's what yeah. I did before. I'm like, I'm done. And so that's what I did at that time. I'm like, listen, like you, you gotta, you got a couple months to get out. Um, whatever you'll I'll pay for your apartment for months, you know, cause you're the mother of my, my daughter, whatever you need. I, we just can't be together. We're not for each other. We're toxic and let's just do this cordially. Uh, she would just ignore that. And pretty much the, new, the next day she would be try, in bed trying to cuddle with me. I started sleeping in the other room. She would come in there and I try to cuddle with me. I'm like, what do you not understand what I'm telling you every day? And it was just like, she didn't want to believe it. So she literally, like, it was like going through one ear and out the other. And like, I was talking to my friends during this time and they're like, you're in a tough spot, man. I was like, yeah, I just can't, I go, I'm miserable. I cannot even be around this person. My skin crawls, like it was that bad. Um, and so 
I uh, kept telling her and kept telling her, and um, that's when my tricep was healing. And so she, you know, during this time I was healing, so I was I was on pain medicine. That's when, like, my pain medicine stuff happened. And I had a doctor at that time that was prescribing Nubain. Um, so it was the hydrocodone. I was doing the Nubain. And um, so I had the, the two sinus surgeries. And then I had the um, tricep surgery. And while, when I had the tricep surgery, I'm like, well, I'm going to be out anyways. I'll just take care of my hernia too. So that was all planned. And then um, that's how I got hooked on the Nubain at first. Because I always had access to new Bane from um, a doctor friend of mine that would prescribe it. And uh, so you know, that's the, that's the start to my, the opiate thing. And I'll tell about that later, but um, the, the night before something happened, she really wanted me to go to dinner with her and her mom. And my tricep was in a lot of pain. I did not, there's no way I wanted to go to dinner. And she was just kept asking me, please, would you just please come to dinner with us? It'd be a lot to me. I'm like, no, I'm not coming to dinner with y'all. And I understood, I understood now what it probably was. She talked to her mom and it was probably a plea like for her, her, her mom to talk some sense to me to say like, Hey, y'all are a family, you know, stay together, work things out. And, um, you know, I just didn't want to go to dinner. And so the next morning she came in the room and of course I'm, you know, in bed sleeping late too, because I was prescribed the, the new Bane and I was also on Clonopin and like a muscle relaxer too from the doctor. Um, she would you know, let, my, let my daughter come, you know, give me, give me some kisses before school. My daughter was only two at this time. And then uh, that morning also, um, my ex was like kissing me on my face and she was like bawling and I'm just like, Oh, I just like chopped up, like whatever. She's just, you know, I don't know. Just, I didn't really care. I just said, whatever. It's just, it was weird and I was still half asleep. So I wake up and I uh, look at my phone and she would always text me like, Hey, I, I just dropped, you know, our daughter off at of school. I didn't have that text and my heart just dropped and I knew something was wrong. And so I called the school and um, I'm like, Hey, is my daughter there? And they're like, Oh no, she's not there to hear today. I'm like, I go, this girl took my daughter and that's what she did. She kidnapped my daughter. So I'm calling her phone. Um, it's going straight, you know, the voicemail is off. Um, called up to her work. Um, no, she's not on the schedule to work anytime soon. And um, I called one of my best friends over. He's like, I was like, he's like, dude, she'll probably be back in a day or two. I'm like, no, I'm like it, she. I've been breaking up with her for literally the past six, seven, whatever months. She would not take my daughter from me and just pop back up a week or two later. And think things are going to be okay. You just took my daughter. Yeah. So I'm like, this is serious. Um, I didn't know how, what, how, what extent it to what it was to. I mean, so I emailed her, um, like, what, what is going on? What did, and I got an email back a couple days later saying, you know, hey, um, if you admit to A, B, and C, um, I will come back home. And she was talking about some crazy stuff about assaulting her with weapons. And I'm like, no, I'm not going to admit to that. <laughs> First of all, it never happened. <laughs> and obviously, you're trying to set me up so I don't get my child or something. Because she knew my world was my daughter. So that's the only way she could hurt me, okay, since... I guess I was hurting her and not giving her a relationship and not wanting to become a family. Um, Cause I remember a few weeks before that I had some clients in town. And I was just kind of joking, like, yeah, we'll, we'll never get married and this and that. I mean, I bought her engagement ring just to make her happy and just kind of like, you know, chill for a while. You know, a lot of guys do that, but um, never planned marrying her. And I was like, yeah, I would never marry you. And she was, that would, it would hurt her feelings. I oh, mean, hold on, Muhammad. I got to stop you there. Leslie, is that <laughs> 
Is that something guys do? They just buy they buy a, a, an engagement ring to pacify the girl. I'm sure it happens, Dave. I wouldn't recommend it. I mean, if a guy can't tell a woman and she won't hear it, it's the I would want to talk to that guy and say, look, if she's not accepting, we're never going to be together. You got to hightail it out of there. Don't stay. Don't buy a ring. Don't buy a ring. Phone. Don't buy a ring. <laughs> it's kind of Here sends you. the wrong message, but yeah, well, I mean, I she, had right. my, she had my daughter, and I just wanted to make right. sure. No, I know, I know, know, I, know, know. I know. Just, just so yeah. you, were, you were making the situation definitely worse. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so, um, so I, so I call the police. I'm not a fan of the police, but I called them, and uh, they come over and you know, um, telling them what's happened. They're like, okay, and I'm like, y'all can't do anything. Like, this is not kidnapping. They're like. Well, it'd only be kidnapping if you took the child. I'm like, okay, so just because it came out of her vagina, it, she get she would not get charged, but I do, I I would. I don't, and so I guess that's how it is. So I called an attorney that day too, and they they told me the same thing. There's like, there's nothing really you can do except wait. And um, during this time, I wouldn't like had my tricep surgery. I wasn't going to be able to take care of my daughter anyways for at least about four months while I was healing because I had a full tear. Um, and so I was like, I lost my mind. I mean, it, I didn't know where my daughter was. We communicated on email, probably maybe 10 emails back and forth. And then communication stopped completely. So I figured she was in like a woman's shelter because her family, uh, did not have money at all so they wouldn't probably even be able to help her take care of the child um you know food and uh, medical wise or anything and so i'm like she's not with her family because um i even did a welfare i i, I did welfare checks to there and a couple of other family members house uh if people don't know what that is you call the police and say hey can you go check up on these right, here i'm right. afraid you know like something might be going on like that someone might be in danger and the police go up and say, hey, can I look around and, you know, whatever. So my, my daughter wasn't in any of those places. So um, and then one of the emails were like, you know, I'm in a safe place. And uh, if it was some wacky email, like basically saying God will bring us together again. I just need some time. And I'm like, that's fine if you need some time. You don't kidnap my daughter. You don't kidnap right, my daughter. Right, right. right. Um, and so each day went by, day went by, and I, I mean, I was up at night. I, I, my daughter was gone. I didn't know where she was, and it eventually got to a point where um, I really didn't even know if she was even alive anymore. I mean, I hired PIs, uh, hired an attorney. PIs came up with nothing. So no credit cards were being used. No cell phone was being used. So they're like, she's at a women's shelter or some organization. And I was like, don't you have to like have a police report or something to get in? He's, he's like, yes, most of them you do, but some might take them since Plano's a really, really nice um, area. There's certain you know organizations out here that might take a woman in just from their story. And I'm like, okay, so that's where we figured, you know, this was because she had no money, her family had no money. So okay. um, it was about month number five and my attorney, I'm like, what do we do? She's like, well, the next step would be to file a writ of attachment. That's where um, you pretty much write a statement. She goes, after this, it's gonna be war, but it's been almost six months and your daughter's not back, Armand. And the only, you know, reason I waited this long, because even if I got her back, I wouldn't be able to take care of her because of my injury. Right. So we decided to follow a writ of attachment. So it's basically, I write out like stuff about our relationships, um, my concerns, what happened. And then the judge either says yes or no and signs it, right? And if she says yes, um, they'll have a sheriff go find your child and bring your child back to me until court started right so i filed and my attorney said listen once you do this she's going to make because i've done a lot of these she's done a lot of them um and i went through several different attorneys and spent an, an ungodly amount of money um because i hired the best that money could buy obviously 
And uh, she's like, she's going to f- probably file some charges. You know, we've had. Um, and so I was like, okay, she's going to say I beat her up and blah, blah, blah. And I never did. And um, there's no, you know, I, nothing ever happened physically with me getting physical with her. It was the other way around. But, um, uh, and so the judge signed it. And um, literally a couple days later, um, I was friends with certain uh, police uh, officers in the Plano location. So I was checking in with them and they were checking to see if any open cases were open. And literally two days after I filed that, she went and made a police report. Um, and it just was pretty much family violence, like domestic violence. Wait, I'm like, yeah. okay, whatever, I'm ready to deal with this, whatever she said I did, whatever. Um, and so I spoke to the detective on the phone. I actually called and said, hey, I heard there's an open case on me. He's like, how do you know? I'm like, well, is there? He goes, yeah. I said, okay, I'm going to come down there Monday and talk to you with my attorney. He was nice on the phone, whatever. You know, I didn't, I didn't know the guy or anything like that. Um, and so that was planned. So here comes Monday. I just got through working in the morning, training clients, walking out of the gym. So my the gym I trained at, it's pretty much, it's like all glasses, just like all like that. So everybody's looking out that way. There's three fugitive squad I'm getting in my car, three fugitive squad people put guns to my head and they're there to arrest me. Um, and so, you know, I couldn't even put my arm behind my back at that time because my surgery still, I was like, handcuff me in front. They're like, hands behind your back. I'm like, and I kept screaming, handcuff me in front. And you'll re-injure my tricep. Right, right. So they did, they took me away and I'm our cars and parked in the back. I'm like, what the is going on? And obviously I knew it had to do something with that, but like, what is, like, what is this? Um, so we go, you know, they bring me back to the jail. Uh, the guy's like, I was being, you know, nice with these people. And he gets on the phone with the, the, the detective I was supposed to talk to. So this detective sent these people there, even knowing I was coming in later on to catch me at the gym, to mess up my reputation and money and all that stuff. And, you know, it did. Um, so they put a hold, you know, when you go to jail, you get a, you get a phone call, of course, as soon as you, you know, book, you get booked in. So there was a hold on my phone call and that's because they were doing a search warrant of my house for, I guess the report was, it's funny, but it's not funny because all this stuff stuck until I went to trial that I stabbed her. I beat her up with a police baton and I beat her up with brass knuckles. I'm 280 pounds, but I need these weapons to harm a girl, a 120 pound girl, right? And I'm like, there's no way that this is crazy. And so the detective comes back to the jail, the one I originally spoke to, and he's like, bring a DB out. And he's like, literally talking shit to me. He's like, we got you, we're gonna bury you under the jail. Um, we found GHB in your house. We found this. And I actually had a prescription to GHB at the time called Zyram. And I'm like, yeah, it's a prescription. He goes, well, it wasn't the prescription. We're going to bail you under the jail. And so I've dealt with detectives before, obviously, in police. And this wasn't a detective just being an asshole or doing his job. This, his emotions were involved. I'm like, they're literally seeing each other in the process of seeing each other are just, you know, really close friends. Because when she made that call, He's, he's over domestic violence in Plano, and so he's the one that took over the whole thing. So, and I was telling people, like, they're literally, and, and people are like, Armand, you're being paranoid. I'm like, no, I'm not being paranoid. They are together. And so I got bonded out, of course, at a $100,000 bond. $100,000? 100000 Holy. 100000 three, three ag assaults, deadly weapon. So I had to get an ankle monitor. Um put on. I had that for like seven months. During this time, I met my current wife and um, she didn't even ask me what it was. She thought it was just something <laughs> maybe she, like a fitness tracker or something. Because I'm like, why didn't you ask me 
for, you know, I had to tell her eventually because I, and then I asked her, like, why did you ever ask me what was on my ankle? She goes, I don't know. I figured it was something to do with fitness or, you know, <laughs> <laughs> and she, and my, and my wife, she's so sweet. I mean, she was, when I met her, she was just lived in a bubble. I mean, she's, she's a doctor and went and went to school and you, you know how that is. And she's, uh, you know, she's Asian, so different culture, family, and, you know, it's just, right, right. so me and her were just friends at that time. You know, we met, uh, I think I, she hired me to do a diet for her. And then we, we met at the gym and I was training here. We were, and we became just really close friends during this time. Um, and, um, you know, so I was on this really strict probation. I was still living in Plano at the house there and crazy stuff was happening. I would have friends leave my house and unmarked cars would be following them. They weren't even trying to be like secretive about it. They'd be like right on their tail and keep following them. Um, one night there was, so I had my guns in my house too. I had two Glocks right on my nightstand and they were loaded, uh, you know, in the chamber and everything. So when they did a search Wait, just for the people who don't know, everyone in Texas has a handgun. So that's, <laughs> that's not unusual. Yeah. <laughs> Good. So, you know, I'm sure she told the cops something crazy. I think what came out in the report that she told him, uh, she was like, Armand said he would never be arrested again. He would do, there would be a shootout before he went back to jail. Oh my went God. <laughs> so they do a search warrant in my house. I didn't have anything in there because I wasn't really bodybuilding at that time. I had some testosterone prescription and bring, but that's about it. So she, they thought, and then at that time too, um, they cross-referenced my name and one of my close friends' names with being distributing anabolic steroids. And I'm like, I've never sold steroids. I'm not stupid. I coach people. And if you're a coach, that's all someone has to do. Hey, hire you as a coach, and that'd be a great setup. So I'm not dumb. I've been, you know, coaching people for 20 years, and you know a lot of the people over the years. Hey, can I get some stuff? You're like, yeah, that's a detective or that's yeah. a law enforcement. So, um, you know, so no, they really they came up empty empty hand, and they were mad. And so, uh, first we had to start my custody hearings. Okay, and um, that that detective was coming with my ex to the custody hearings. And I'm like, this isn't normal. And they would literally show up and he would have his arm around her walking because when I would go to court, I would have um, friends there, like in the parking lot, like looking out and I also had PIs. I mean, I was, you know, driven and catching whatever was going on. Um, and I'm like, Passed to my attorney, can they just do that? He goes, well, you know, we brought it up in court eventually. Like she's in the back of the of the parking lot, hugging on this detective before they go into court, and then he's getting on the stand, talking about basically he messed up my whole custody case because I've got these charges, so I I got I could only do supervised visitations with my daughter, and that was infuriating because I I pretty much raised my daughter, sure. and. I had to have someone come and sit around while I was with my daughter. My daughter didn't like it at all. She would be like, daddy, daddy, like come and like take me to the closet and shut the closet. She was mad. Somebody else was there and was confused. She was like two and a half at this time going on three. And, um, you know, it was hard on her. And then when I got her back, she was just a sad baby. And that broke my heart. She wasn't at the little happy, just, baby that I just had six, seven months prior during this time. I'm like, where have they been living? Who they've been around? I mean, as a father that will drive you literally insane. And when they were missing my daughter, I would literally just drive around town like for hours thinking I'm just going to spot the car. And like, I didn't know what else to do. Did you ever find out where they were? Um, so I had my cop friend run their plates. That's another story. Several times, nothing came back. And then, no. Uh, so I wasn't allowed to know where they lived. But, yeah, we I had the PIs. They found out where she lived, just so I knew where my daughter was at. Close to you um, or, or no? What? Was she close to you or was she, was she far? Uh, she about 20 minutes away. Okay. 
But I moved out of my house and I got an apartment in downtown Dallas right away because my attorney's like, they're going to keep messing with you in Collin County. So there's Dallas County and right next is Collin County, which is a county with really no crime. There's nothing going on. So if something goes on, they they attack it and you don't want to live there if, you know, um, and I found out people was like, don't live in Collin County if you're bodybuilding, if you're taking gear, they get to know everybody. And then one of my best friend's wife was a, a cop there and they were, that was his ex-wife. So she was telling all the cops, our, all our business anyways, like, you know, about me or whatever. So, but my life was clean at that time. I wasn't, you know, on cycles. I wasn't, you know, doing any recreational stuff or anything. Um, and uh, the court, I just kept going nowhere, going nowhere. I went through several different attorneys and then the criminal stuff that takes forever. We didn't even, I mean, they were offering me 15 years prison. That was like the oh, final God. offer. And you know, when you get close to the court, they'll be like, okay, 10 years probation, this, this, they said from the beginning to my attorneys, this is our only offer. We've got him. Um, he, we, this is a, this is a cl close uh, case and we're not coming off this. And my attorney was like, Armand, is there anything you're not telling? I'm like, no, there literally nothing happened. Had, luckily I kept all my text messages that all these days she said these events happened. All the texts were just normal everyday texts. Like, Hey, I'm on the grocery store. Okay. Love you. Love you. Or whatever. You know? So it was nothing, you know, there was no evidence, no, nothing. That's why I'm like, and everybody's telling me there's no way this is going to stick. Well, it sure did stick because when you have a detective that is screwing your ex and he's up there and been with the, you know, department forever, they've got some power. I even called internal affairs because, uh, you know, in Dallas, I grew up in church with uh, the guy that was a, a district attorney. And he's like, dude, call internal affairs. I called him and they said they found nothing wrong with them hugging and coming to court and held in hand. And I'm like, right, because they're all friends, right? So, um, I mean, I would be on the stand crying about my daughter in custody court. This detective would be in the stands literally laughing out loud while I'm crying. And I'm looking at the judge. I'm like, you're not even going to say anything? Like, right. and, and I wanted to, you know, what this guy. And so it became so personal between us. And he was at every single thing. And this guy even got a hold of every girl that he possibly could that I ever dated going back to high school. And I had several girls call me and like, Hey, Armand, this detective called me and said, Hey, basically, do you hate Armand? Um, do you want to come to court and say he abused you like straight up? And I had several girls call me and that's what he was doing. He was calling exes of mine, like scorned exes to see if they were mad at me to come to court to say, yeah, Armand was abusive to try to build up, you know, and I think one girl said she would come. And that was one of the girls I was dating during that time. I was seeing my ex because she thought I was going to leave my ex eventually and be with her. Uh, but I told her, even though I, if I leave her, I'm still not going to be with you. Um, the thing is I'm straightforward with girls, but the thing is a lot of women are like, Oh, they're just saying that, you know? So she got on their side and she was like, calling me, checking up on me, and she was recording our phone calls because I just had a feeling that she would just ask me weird questions. She's like, do you still do GHB? Or is it like, I'm like, why aren't you asking me these questions? And so I found out she was recording me. I called her from a different number one day. Whatever app she had, she put it on late and goes, call tracking. So I heard that she started recording a phone call. So I, and I emailed her. I said, listen, you want to get involved in this? It's about my child. I've got all these texts, you know, that you sent me that paints the whole picture and a lot of stuff that you don't want out there. Just, just go away. You don't want to get involved. Just leave me alone. Go live your life. Um, cause I, I mean, I, I did break a couple girls hearts at this time and, um, you know, the ex, she was basically like, you know, we were supposed to be together. You broke up our family. I mean, she was just scorned and I got a court. I had to go, to go to counseling during all this time, take these parenting classes. And the, the counselor that the um, courts gave me, actually, um, we got along great. 
older black lady, she was just, she's like, from getting to know me, she's like, I believe you, and this is crazy, but this is what happens when you, and you're, in her eyes, Armand, you destroyed her life. She thought y'all are going to be married. You're going to live, grow old together and all this. And in your mind, that was never even an option and you destroyed her life. She's going to come after you with everything she has and try to destroy your life, which almost happened. I mean, it was, it was a battle and um, I'm strong, but it was some of the hardest stuff I've ever been through in my life. So during this time is when I went through my surgeries and, you know, I was on new Bane and all that too. And I was like, okay, I'm going to come off new Bane. And I did, I was like, it was only like a week and I was like, had a cold. It wasn't even that bad. And I was using a lot of new Bane. And then my doctor wouldn't prescribe it anymore. So he sent me to a pain management and they prescribed me oxys and Dilaudid. Oh, and um, like way stronger than new Bane, not even on the same yeah. level. That's what started my whole opiate addiction. So I still had pain, but during this time, I would, the doctors were still writing me scripts. And that was also, you know, um, numbing my emotional pain because I'll be honest. I mean, why, people do drugs because they work, but eventually they stop working. And they did its job at the time. They would numb me because I couldn't even go. I couldn't even, I was literally crying all day. I wasn't with my daughter. I was heartbroken. So, um, but that's what led to never, I mean, I didn't know there was such serious withdrawals that it was going to be the hardest thing in my life to come off this stuff. So, let, me, let me stop you here for a second, Armand, because we're, we're, this is going to be a part two, obviously, because this, this is a very long story. I want, to, I want to get Leslie's analysis of what you've heard so far. I mean, obviously, the scorned ex, the now, obviously, opiate addiction that's starting here. Um, obviously, he's facing, you know, charges you could go to jail for assault something you didn't even do uh i mean this is i mean this is a lot of strain for one human being to have to handle i mean uh, i mean obviously this is a perfect storm for someone to go and and rely on drugs to numb themselves from i mean i'm sure you see this an awful lot let me add one more thing real quick because i get asked yes. this question a lot mm -hmm. so i also got added to this random steroid testing and you can't beat those tests. They had to do your analysis as yeah. tests for four different yeah. drugs. And so that's what kind of ended my bodybuilding too. I couldn't take, I couldn't take, take right. gear. And to this day, yeah. I still get randomly tested, but I can take stuff from the doctor. Um, so but, they, they took his passion. He can't even, he couldn't even compete. So yeah, the water has gone, you know, uh, his mother passed. You know, obviously he's facing assault charges and, and he can't even go to the, you know, he can't even compete in bodybuilding, which is what he loves to do. I mean, that's that's a lot for one human being to have to handle. It is. And the thing is, is that it's very easy to make some very poor choices to saying, well, why bother? You know, the, the court system, the legal system, you know, it seems like it's against me. Why should I bother trying? Why don't I just continuously numb the pain? It's not worth it. So you know, it's not a just about being mentally strong. This would crush anybody, Armand. So I don't want you to take away from this that, you know, anyone who's gotten addicted to any kind of pain meds, there's a reason for it, you know, and it's it's about not being able to cope. But what you've been able to do is being able to go off the pain meds. You're still trying, like you still have a lot of, uh, you know, a journey to go through. But what you do have is, you know, you have some social support, which is really important. Your wife, you and I spoke before this, this, uh, before we, we, we started this episode and you have such a great advocate in your wife, which makes it so much, not easier, but more manageable to deal with any kind of stress because one, you're not alone Two, you get validated. You're not the crazy one, because sometimes when stuff like this happens, we almost think that, do I deserve this? You know, because of these choices I made, do I deserve this? And my answer is no. <laughs> you know, you know, you tried to explain to the ex that you weren't interested in her. She wasn't able to accept it. Um, like I said, there's there's some mental health issues, which I can talk about a little bit later, but that's impacting her behavior towards you. Now, as far as what you can control, I've, I've said this before on the show is control the controllables. What you've been able to do is to say, 
okay, I, I hired the best lawyer that I can. You know, I'm trying to do the best that I can. I'm documenting stuff. I'm keeping text messages, which if anyone's watching this and they're going through a similar situation, it's easy to say, I want to delete everything because you don't want to have any memories. This is your backup. You need a backup because yeah. it's basically one person's word against the other. And even that is not good enough in the court system. Unfortunately, there's such a big um, favoritism towards women, which is not which is not fair. I'm not saying for all women in all cases, that's that's necessarily, you know, because there are true allegations. This is bullshit, you know, and the fact that you have to fight against something that's not true can do a mental number on you. So for you to be able to have some type of something to hold on to. And I think, you know, fighting for your daughter is also another piece to saying it's not just you. You're also impacting the life of your daughter when you guys are able to get back together because you're a role model. You know, you're as her father, you are her role model. And, you know, that, you know, sometimes we need that reason for living. It comes into the little people in our lives. Yeah. And, and, and every daughter loves her daddy. You know that whether even even the bad daddies, you know. <laughs> yeah. Well, we're going to we're going to stop here. We're going to stop here. We're going to put this up. because I think Armand laid out a very, you know, interesting story. Obviously, something that's probably way more convoluted than than anyone else has gone through. But probably a lot of people can relate to parts of what you've gone through. And uh, it's a terrible, it's a terrible scenario. But you're going to tell us how the whole thing resolved in part two when we come back uh, next week. So thank you uh, for joining us today, uh, Armand, and being so forthright. Leslie, thanks for your insights. And then Guys, stay tuned for next week's episode where we're going to get the whole resolution of, of how it all worked out. Luckily, it's got a happy ending. So for now, I'm Dave Palumbo with Leslie Timble and Armand Adibi. We'll see you next time.